Hello, uh, and welcome to Names 102. I'm Yehuda ben Moshe, Elmet Herald uh, from the East Kingdom. Um, the, uh, this, we're, this class is going to cover two basic uh, areas. We're going to cover um, what, what needs to be documented when submitting a name. Um, what, I, what do you need to document, and um, how to present your documentation on a, on a submissions form. Additionally, uh, so that, that's part one. Part two is uh, we're going to do a very brief survey of um, the most useful resources in the most common languages that we document in the SCA. Far from exhaustive, there's you know hundreds of articles, hundreds, thousands of books out there. I'm going to try to hit kind of the highlights, the, the stuff that is most useful, the stuff that uh, I usually start with uh, when I get a request in a particular language. So I'm, as always, I'm going to start um, my slideshow presentation, and then we will uh, begin. OK. Uh, so. First thing, uh, two references. These are references I used a lot in developing this. Um, one is an article called How to Document a Name Not Quite Within an Inch of Its Life by Mistress Juliana de Luna. Uh, she's the um, Pelican Herald Emeritus. She just stepped down as Pelican Herald, as Pelican Sovereign of Arms uh, a few months ago. And um, a lot of what I'm doing here is from her um, article. The other uh, very useful resource is uh, um, Mr. Salas McIntosh, our uh, now Blue Tiger Herald, used to be Eastern Crown, uh, wrote an article on uh, um, documenting a name, and um, that's those are the two links. Uh, I highly recommend looking at them. A lot of my material is based on them. A number of my examples are just stolen outright from Alice. Um, and uh, these are both uh, good resources that go into a little more detail than we will here. So, first of all, the requirements. Um, the requirements come not from SENA but from the administrative handbook. And the requirements talk about what needs to be on the letter of intent. They don't actually talk about the submissions form at all. They say those that on a letter of intent you must include a summary of all supporting evidence provided for the submission, uh, and you must include documentation. Uh, uh, permissions to conflict, proofs of entitlement, um, a history of the previous submissions, including dates. It should include specific references for all supporting documentation, URLs, headings, page numbers. Uh, omissions of any, of any part of this are grounds for a return, what we call an administrative return. We don't do it a lot, uh, but it is quite possible to have something returned simply because it was not adequately documented. Now, this is a requirement on this letter of intent, on the submissions here. However, that doesn't mean that we as consulting heralds can skip any of this. Because the truth is, uh, a kingdom herald gets, any, a kingdom submissions herald gets anywhere from a dozen to three or four dozen uh, submissions every month. Uh, in the East, we've been averaging 30 to 40 every single month, and 50 or 60 in the months after Pentecost. Um, the submissions herald simply can't do this for us. Uh, which means if we don't include a summary of documentation, if we don't include all of these things in our submission, either the submissions herald has to do our work for us, the uh, commenters have to do it, or it's going to get returned administratively for lack of documentation. Um, th this, is, this really is the job of the consulting herald. Um, well, you know, le uh, legally, in quotes, uh, under the rules, it's the job of the submitter. But in practice, if the submitter could do this without us, they wouldn't need us, which makes it our job as consulting parents. Um, you know, we can't always do it, and there are exceptions, and we'll talk about it as we go along. But basically, if you're, uh, it's not the job of the commenters. A lot of times, you get uh, submissions that go, we couldn't document this, please help. OK, sometimes that's legit. Sometimes something is really obscure, and there's maybe only two or three people in the SCA that know how to fix it. 90% of the time, that's not the case. Um, and we see it from all over the society. I see lots of letter of, in of intent, especially at the kingdom level, when there's just nothing, no documentation at all. 
And that's basically somebody saying, you guys do my job for me. Please don't do that. So what do we have to document? Each name element. If you go back to my uh, Names 101 class or look in Sina uh, Personal Names Part 1 or Non-Personal Names Part 1, it talks about what's a name element. But basically every word. You know, if, if you're submitting uh, John Jones Smith, then you have to document John, you have to document Jones, you have to document Smith. Um, it doesn't matter how common they are. It doesn't matter how obvious you, they are, you know. We all know that John is a period English name. You should still include some documentation. You don't need to spend hours looking for it, you know, find the, the first and easiest one, but to put something in there. Would this that, be an example of too much is better than not enough? Too much? Well, we will talk about summarizing documentation. It, no, too much is not better than not enough. You really want just right. Um, what you're supposed to say is you're supposed to summarize the documentation. We'll get to that in a second. Let, let, let's skip a little. Um, and you have to document the overall construction of the name. Uh, again, I talk about it in Names 101, and, it, and it's discussed in those Sina sections I've cited. But basically, this is Appendix A of Sina. It says, what, how do you build a name in this language? Now, again, if I'm submitting John Smith, we all know that a given name and a surname are perfectly acceptable construction in English. You should still say, Given name plus surname is an acceptable construction in English under Appendix A. Mentioned. You know, because for a number of reasons. One, it means no one has to wonder. Because, you know, there's some German speaking herald from Drakenwald looking at that and going, well, is that right? I better go double check. So you're saving him work. And two, maybe you're wrong. I mean, John Smith, you're not going to be wrong on, but there's lots of other things where people frequently say, well, this is an obvious construction, and it turns out not to be. Okay, um, or maybe it's just an uncommon one, and you looked and said, "Oh, well, that's obvious," but maybe the next person doesn't see it as obvious. All it needs is a a line most of the time, you know. Given plus by name as per appendix A. Done. That's all you've got to say. All right. So let's talk about sources. Um, when we're documenting, we're looking for a source for all of each of our name elements. Uh, and for patterns, we may need it if we're going beyond Appendix A. If you want something outside Appendix A, you've got to document. So what's a good source? What, what should we be using? First of all, primary sources. If you have a scan or a photograph or a photocopy of an actual original period documentation document, that's the best source there is. You know, we have, um, there's, you can get photos of, uh, Scottish parliamentary records from like 1400 on, one of Alice's favorite sources. If you see, a, if we have a picture of an actual document from the 15th century and it has the name John in it, that's as good a documentation as you will ever find. Now be careful of transcriptions because you, you want to make sure that the text has not been altered. Because sometimes when uh, authors transcribe period documents, they modernize words, they modernize names. And that's no good. Um, Okay. So we, any source we use, whether primary or secondary, um, we want to make sure the names are not n normalized. They're not modernized. Um, most history books normalize their names. If, you, if the book you've got is a normal history text, you, I don't necessarily mean like a high school textbook, but just a book on history, the names are almost certainly modern. Okay? Uh, no one called Charlemagne Charlemagne in, you know, when he was alive. He was Charles de Grosse or uh, Carolus Magnus. He was not Charlemagne. Charlemagne came, the, the, that word came much later. And a history book will call him Charlemagne. Um, so how do you tell? Well, you can look at the introduction, and a lot of books will discuss what it does with names. Does it not normalize it? Does it not? Um, there's one book on Irish names we'll uh, mention later where it says very explicitly, the header forms are normalized, the rest is not. So, you know, the, the way, the, the kind of the subsections of the book are modern, but within them it gives you period forms. Fine, don't use those mod modern forms. The other good clue is if you see multiple spellings of the same name present, that's a pretty good indicator that they're not normalized, okay? If, you know, sometimes you see John, and sometimes you see Johannes, and sometimes it's a different spelling, that's a, in the same book, that's a pretty good, be uh, 
that's a pretty good evidence that they've not normalized the names. Okay, that they are, this is especially for things like transcriptions, that they're keeping the original spellings. The other thing we want is dated forms. Okay, you want dates that are before 1650, or better yet, before 1600. 1600 to 1650 is, of course, a great period. Uh, what you don't want is things like, you know, this is an ancient Irish name. Well, great, you know, when the heck did ancient start? You know, or this is a, you know, medieval name. You see that a lot in places like name books, uh, you know. Uh, you know, this is an ancient uh, German name. Well, maybe, but ancient is not a date. So we want dates. We want evidence of when the date is. Now, maybe the date, the form is dated. Maybe the whole document is dated, but you've got to know the date. Um, and it has to be a reliable source. Um, scholarly and academic works are usually good. You know, generally speaking, anything that you get in like a scholarly publication is probably as good as or better than any, than what we do. SCA specific articles are usually good because they're done to the standards we want for our use. They're generally also much easier to read than the scholarly and academic stuff. Genealogical data, baby name books are generally not reliable. They, they, that's where you get you know the ancient Irish name. Um, and it turns out that the name was invented in, you know, 1850 by somebody. Um, you know, genealogical stuff uh, is generally not okay because it's generally compiled by modern people using any, using different standards. So places like um, um, Ancestry.com, you know, even if someone claims, well, you know, my ancestor is from 1623 and his name was John Smith. Well, maybe, but what are you basing that on? You know, now maybe they've got a photocopy of their original family Bible that was actually, you know, that was written in 1620, or maybe this is what, you know, his grandfather compiled, uh, you know, 50 years ago. We don't know, and there's usually no indication, which is why we don't use those. There's a, a site called BehindTheName.com, which is, you know, we've seen a lot of people refer to, it is not an acceptable source. Um, uh, the other thing that's not acceptable is those websites that try to sell you, you know, the history of your name and your arms and stuff, you know, that, that's at best Victorian and at worst made up entirely. Um, all right. So we have what's called photocopy and no photocopy uh, sources. These are listed in Appendix H, is a list of all the non-photocopy, no photocopy sources, except the family search IGI records. Uh, that is no photocopy by precedent, but it's not on that list. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, it means if it's a, if it's not a no photocopy source, you have to include a copy of whatever it is you're doing. You got to include it with the submission. This is being revised from time to time. We may be decreasing this slowly, but basically, you've got to make a copy, even if it's a website. You got to print out the website because what we're trying to avoid is you you find some website that has great data. You put in the URL in the submission, and between now and nine months from now when the submission is reviewed, that website goes down or it's changed. Guess what? Now you don't have documentation for your name. It's going to get reset. Now, a question about uh, as far as the website, are we still looking for like the entire web page that can be like 23 pages long? Or just, um, like, well, usually, as with books or long articles, what you want, generally want is the title page and then whatever page the actual information is on. So okay. If you have a 700-page book, you're certainly not expected to photocopy each page. Photocopy the title page so everyone can see, okay, here's the name, here's the author, here's the publication info, and photocopy the page that, it, that the element is actually on, and then whatever else you think may be relevant. You know, maybe if you're concerned about normalization, include that introduction that says, you know, all names are in original spellings, or whatever, whatever else that is relevant to what you're doing. Um, so, an important one on this for websites, a URL is not enough. So what does that mean? It means that most of the time, I really prefer to start with no photocopy sources. Um, because if I can do that, it's easier for me, it's easier for the submissions herald, it's less stuff to scan, to copy, to mail. Um, so, some general sources that are good. Uh, articles on heraldry.sca.org. If you click articles and then names, you'll find lots of articles. These are all no photocopy. Anything on heraldry.sca.org is no photocopy. Uh, and you, they're generally anything in there is acceptable, no further requirements. You don't need to prove that they're good. If they weren't good, they wouldn't be published. And uh, yeah, that's the theory anyway. 
Um, if you go to s-gabriels.org, it's the uh, Academy of St. Gabriels, which is one of our other fantastic resources for names, you have what's called numbered reports. Um, the way the uh, St. Gabriels used to work is people would send them a question, they would prepare a specific answer, and they would publish it as a report. These are numbered. Uh, these are also no photocopy, but you've got to be careful of the early ones. Um, anything before about report 1000, you will have a big red warning on the top saying, you know, caution, this, this is old, this may no longer be reliable. Because in the, I don't know what, 10, 20 years or so that the Academy of St. Gabriel's has existed, standards for names have changed. You know, we've gotten more rigorous as more resources has become available, so some of the early stuff may no longer be valid. So be careful with that. And then there's articles on St. Gabriel's. They're also very good. They're uh, generally acceptable, but they are they do require photocopies. They're not no photocopy. Now, um, I know lots of people don't bother photocopying it. I don't think we've been returning many things, many things for not photocopying St. Gabriel's, but technically it is required. Um, if you look at an Oscar and commentary, you'll frequently see uh, comments, especially from Alison McCool of Elfane, former Laurel, going, you know, there's no photocopies included of this and it's required. Yeah, it is. Um, honestly, I don't use the number of reports much. I tend to use the articles much more. But uh, but the advantage of the reports is that they're, that they're not for no work. All right. Uh, uh, other good general sources. Name books. There's lots of books. Um, but be careful, because not every book is born equal. Um, Administrative Handbook Appendix F has a list of books that are not acceptable at all. Mostly it's things like baby name books, but also a few uh, books that we used to use but have now realized they're no good. The other thing, this is a personal caution, that Appendix H, the no photocopy uh, list, don't use it as a shopping list. Um, this is the voice of experience talking. I bought quite a number of books, some of them very expensive because they were on that list, only to realize later that they're completely useless to me. They're cool books. They're just not something I actually need. Um, the, the no photocopy list is a list of books that are commonly available in the College of Arms. Most uh, senior kingdom heralds, most uh, senior society heralds will own a copy of all of those books. The uh, society offices, Pelican and Reith, have their own libraries that belong to the SCA. They're, they contain generally all the items in those uh, in those books. It's not a list of useful books. It's not a list of good books. It's just a list of common books. Um, now, a lot of the books that we do like are out of print but are available used. And if you do want a list, um, I have one at yehudaheraldry.com. What I basically took is when we set up Harold's Point, there is a list po uh, that is published of these are the books we'd like people to bring to Harold's Point. I took that and I resorted it by how important people think, how important the books were, and I use that as my shopping list. So that, that's something people can use. Just be careful. It's not a definitive list, and not everything on there is something everyone needs. You know, very high on the list is, uh, I think, a book on drawing Japanese heraldic motifs. Well, unless you're doing a lot of Japanese heraldry, that's probably not a book that you need in your personal life. Oscar. Uh, this is my one of my favorite cheats. Um, if you have a name that you need to document, the first thing you can do is go to Oscar and search for it. If someone else has already submitted it, go look at if it was registered. If it was, just steal their documentation. That's it. It can be as easy as that. I've documented impossibly to impossible to document uh, names like that. Japanese names. I know nothing about Japanese names. I can't do Japanese names. You know what? If someone came to me with the Japanese names and I found it on Oscar, I would copy, cut and paste it into the submission form. I might not even understand what the heck those documentations said, but if the name was was accepted on the strength of that documentation, I'm fine with it. So basically, for something like that, it is okay to say, look through uh, Oscar, see that it was approved in the, in the arms of Memorial, and go cut and paste and just slide it over to your uh, paperwork? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, now, what's not acceptable is to say, you can't say, I'm submitting John, and my documentation is that uh, John was previously registered three years ago. That's not documentation. Okay, prior registration is not a guarantee of future registration, or as someone else put it, we're not required to repeat our previous mistakes. 
Um, however, if John was documented, I can steal the documentation that that previous John used and use it for mine. Perfectly okay. There's no copyright on the Oscar submissions. A very, very convenient way to find documentation, especially for more popular name elements because, you know, as we discussed, Marion is common and I bet we can find a dozen of them. So I don't need to go look for that. I can find what someone else used. Connell, pretty common as well. Um, so use Oscar. It's it's a real good way to, to to start. Another really good general source is Family Search. Okay, this is what used to be called the IGI, the International Gene Genealogical Index. The IGI is part of the Family Search thing, but it's not all of it. There's more. And what this is, that's the website for it. What it is, it's a huge database of genealogical information. Now, we said before, genealogy is usually not a good thing. Um, and that's true. However, um, the family search contains two kinds of data, what they call contributed information and indexed information. Contributed information is useless to us. That's that stuff we discussed where people just upload their family trees and we have no idea where that info came from, how rigorous it was, where they got the spellings, did they normalize, did they not normalize. The indexed information, however, is pretty great. Um, what the indexed information is, is they took thousands and thousands of pages of parish records, church records from all over England, and went through them one by one and put all of the information from them into a database. And they had a pretty rigorous process for it. There was always two researchers looking at every page and verifying that they've got the spelling the same. And that stuff, the index data, is very good, very reliable, and is fantastic, for especially for late period names. I haven't seen anything in there before about late 16th century. So. I think 1550s, 1560s is about as early as I can get. They're constantly adding to it, so there might be more in the future, but um, that's as far back as it really goes. Okay. Um, and you can search by date, by place, by event type. Usually I search for the time period 1000 to 1650, any event, any location, and then go through there. Um, so there are a lot of rules on how to use it because certain things are okay, certain things are not. They're covered in the cover letters that I've listed there. Um, but the important thing is they have to have what's called a batch number and that batch number has to start with B, C, J, K, M, or P except M17 and M18. So anything that has one of those batch numbers is okay. If it doesn't have a batch number at all or the batch number is all numbers, then, there is, then that's no good for the most part. The one exception to that is occasionally you'll run into a bat, a record not from one of those batches where they include the, an actual photo of the document. If they have that and you can read it and you can find what you're looking for, fine. You know, we're not referencing the batch, we're referencing that original document. However, in at least one case where someone did that, we all looked at it and said, you know what, they're wrong. That's not what that says. You know, they, they read that as John, but that doesn't say John. That says, what, you know, Joan or whatever it is. And that was not considered adequate documentation. Um, there's an article at that URL at heraldry.sc.org that discusses how to use the family search in depth. It also mentions all of those rules, uh, what batch numbers and such. I recommend you keep it handy. Uh, to reference uh, for because uh, uh, until you've done it a lot you just will not, you know, I found it, it took me a long time to remember the batches. So how does it work? If you go to familysearch.org slash search, that's the screen you'll get. Uh, there's first name, last name, so you put something in there. Uh, you click on the any button and to add the any place uh, and put in the time period. As you can see I put in 1000 to 1650. There's a checkbox at the bottom that says match all terms exactly. That's optional. Um, if you click that, it'll only return to the exact spelling you want. If uh, you don't, then it expands it a little bit. It does a little bit of letter substitution. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes that's not. And then you hit search, and you get this. And I don't know if you guys can read it on your screens, but it's basically a list of everything that's that matched. And I searched for Smith. Um, and... Um, now, on the left side, it has the search stuff again, so you can modify from here. And on the main part, it has a list of all of those, uh, everything that came up with Smith, what the name of the database it came from, and then some basic info like events, dates, etc. Now, 
there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the name in the database of the database and the batch number, but it's pretty close. So when I see England deaths and burials 1538 to 1991, I'm almost certain that's going to be a B batch. Okay, B is burials, C is christenings, M is marriages. The other ones have different meaning. You can include any of those. Um, so I'm pretty sure these first, you know, dozen Smiths or so are from B batches. They're probably good. Uh, so I will click on one of them and get this. Mary Smith, female. The important thing is, if you look there, it says indexing project batch number, B02850-2. That's that batch number we want. Not the GS film number below. It's got to say batch. And sometimes you'll run across a record that doesn't have it. There's nothing that says batch. Then that's not a good record. That's something else. Okay. Um, so that's that's it. You know, there's my documentation for Smith. Mary Smith, female, buried December 27, 1588, in Gedney, Lincoln, uh, England. Now, um, so when you're citing family search, you have to include the gender, the date, the place, and the batch number. Most of the time, I just include everything. Here's how I would cite her. I'd say, Mary, from family search, Mary Smith, female, burial, 1227-1588, Gedney, Lincoln, England, batch number, and then I include the URL as well for that specific record. Why? Because maybe the commenters are going to want to look at it. You know, and this way they can fuck, just click on it and see. You don't have to have the URL, and the URL by itself is not documentation. Because remember what the administrative handbook said. You have to not just document, you also have to provide a summary of the documentation. So it's not enough to just say, here's where I found it. Go look. You have to say what it is you found. So the first two lines there, that's my summary. The link is the pointer at the actual documentation. Uh, it gives the commenters and Pelican the most possible information to work from. Okay, not so good general sources. Um, the letter of uh, acceptance and returns or the collected precedents. They are not really that great for, for it. You could look at them, but use caution, because first of all, all the LOARs uh, may just not be acceptable in general. Anything over 10 years old is suspect. And back in the 80s, we, you'll find routine arguments over proper grammar for Elvish, because we would register uh, Elvish names, and they, you know, so that's certainly no good. Up until 2009, we accepted something called uh, SCA-compatible names, those are no good anymore either. They were basically names that they're kind of like an SFPP in the uh, armory. They're ba it was basically saying, okay, this is not really a period name, but it's kind of a fantasy-ish name, and lots of people in the SA have been using it for a long time, so we will allow it. In 2009, we said, you know, we're done. There's just no reason for that. Um, so a lot of common names, usually from fantasy sources, went away. Some of them have come back with new research as real names. And as we said before, um, registration is with, if you see registration with no comment, it's not, that's actually a typo, it's not that it's not documentation, it's not precedent. So if you just see, you know, John Smith accepted, that's not, every, that's not documentation, that's not precedent, that's nothing. If there's a discussion and it says, you know, we're accepting Smith because here's, and that is, if it's recent, that you can use. But if it's a registration is without a comment, that doesn't tell you anything. Okay, prior registration is not a guarantee of future registration. We're not bound to repeat our mistakes. Now, if a specific source is listed in that documentation, that may be useful. There's a name right now on the East uh, Internal Letter of Intent, uh, I think Alana Winter, something like that, where the only documentation we have is the fact that it was registered in 2004, and in the registration, it was mentioned where they got the documentation from. Now, it turns out that that's a book that's really hard to find. We've just, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to exist in any accessible libraries. Um, so that's, so we've been citing to that. Uh, okay, so what do we include in the documentation? First of all, if it's a photocopy source, include the photocopies. Now, a URL or the photocopy is not enough. You must summarize the documentation. Failure to summarize is grounds for an administrative return. 
okay? And be truthful when you summarize. Don't exaggerate the value of the source. It's not helpful. We will always check it. It doesn't do anything. And this is something I've seen not commonly, but occasionally. People will say, you know, this source says that, you know, John Smith was, a, was you know, a period name in, 1300, in the 1300s in England. And we look at it, and it turns out, no, it doesn't. You know, it says something like, we th you know, there, there was a different name that later became John Smith, you know, or, so, or something not quite on point. So, so be truthful. There, there, there's no, you know, there, there's there's no money at stake here. There's no reason to, to exaggerate things, uh, even to help your submitter, because we will look at it, and if it doesn't say what it says, then it really didn't help it. All right. So, what do you include? The name of the source. Uh, if it's a no photocopy source, it has a standard abbreviation that's listed in that same uh, administrative handbook, Appendix H. Um, if otherwise, if it's a book or an article, include the name of the book, the author, and the edition. You know, we're not looking for full Chicago style uh, uh, citations. You know, you don't. We don't really care who the publisher is, but do make sure there's enough to f be able to find the book, name of the book, author of the book, the edition. If it's an internet resource, please include the URL. It makes it much easier to find. You know, sometimes you'll see people say, "Well, I found this in the such and such an article on the Saint Gabriel's website." That's great. Now I gotta go to Saint Gabriel's, find the article, track down through its 327 pages to find this thing. If you just give me a URL, I can click on it. Okay, just courtesy. You have to include a summary of all the relevant information. What does the source say? What dates does it list, and what relevant name forms are listed? Okay, not just a page number or section name. Uh, and if it's a descriptive or occupational name, you need to include the meaning if you know it. Okay, we and that's because we check for offensiveness, and we check for offensiveness in all languages. Uh, someone uh, submitted a Norse name not too long ago, which translates basically as asshole, and we would not read, we would not register it. Um, now, none of us would ever know that that's what it means, but we don't register offensive names in any language, and asshole is offensive. You know, it, remember, offensive is a modern standard. The, the period Norse thought it was a fine name, but we want to not offend the modern public, not just ancient Norse. Um, Old Norse, by the way, has the best uh, descriptive by names of any language. If you're not familiar with them, you know, go check it out because you can have lots of fun. My personal favorite is a feminine descriptive by name that translates as bosoms like the prow of a merchant ship. You just can't do any better than that. Uh, as, uh, and lots of the names are offensive, you know, uh, like by a lot, you know, referring to genitalia and body functions and stuff, etc. Um, so that's why we want the meat. But again, you've got to summarize. You've got to say, this is what I found. It's from such and such a time. Um, here's what it says. And then. Um, Include a conclusion. Explain why this source supports your submission. Now, if it's directly on point, you don't need to. You know, if uh, if John is uh, uh, the name and John is what you have in the thing, you don't need a conclusion. We know what the conclusion is. But if you're trying to document Johnson and you don't find Johnson, but you find, you know, um, Bob's son and you find John, then say, you know, it's a name from that same period. We followed the construction. We think this is good. You know. Some kind of summary. Not the, we're not talking about paragraphs worth. We're talking about a line or two, in most cases. Um, you asked about too much. Yes, you can include too much. What some people do is they just take, especially with web sources, take it, cut and paste a whole section. That's not really helpful. First of all, that's not a summary. So technically, that's not a. You have not met the requirement. And second, if you're familiar with the expression "too long didn't read," uh, that's a big problem. Um, during a Pelican meeting, we go through two to three hundred names. You know, we want to see the absolute minimum information necessary to make the decision, which is the date, where it came from, how it was used. We don't have time to read a page and a half of text. Okay, there's a few commenters. I'm not going to call them out by name that have a tendency to post long, incredibly informative, but very, very long monologues in comments pages worth of stuff, wonderful documentation. We really wish they would include like a one sentence topic sentence at the beginning that summarizes what it is they're saying. Okay, their contribution is valuable, but it's not easy to use. 
Same thing here. So too much. I guess too a little bit too much is better than not enough, but a lot too much is also not good. So let's look at an example. This is not a real example. This is one that uh, I modified from a real example. And uh, we're going to use Russian on the theory that if you can follow Russian, you can follow everything west of there. Um, so Ivan Baranov. Ivan, Wickenden found at that. Baranov, Wickenden found at this other thing. That's not adequate documentation. Okay, Wickenden... We know what Wickenden is. Wickenden is a specific uh, source. That's not its name, but we call that a lot. And you've, they've linked to the correct site. And guess what? That's absolutely correct. That's good documentation. What it's not is a good summary, because we have no idea what those things say. Now we've got to go find them. OK? They're not adequately summarized. The construction's not the same. OK, great. You said Ivan and Baranov. Are we allowed to stick them together? Which one's a first name? Which one's a last? What's the given name? What's a by name? How do we know? What can you stick together in Russian? Uh, so let's look at how a good example of that. Okay, there's that same name. So Ivan, Paul, Paul Goldschmidt's Dictionary of Paid Russian Names, second edition. That's important because there's also a third edition. Um, that's the full title of Wickenden. And honestly, if you write Wickenden second there, that's fine as well. We will all know what it means. Section M A. SN, meaning subnomen, under the name, Yoan. Well, there you go. We would have searched for Ivan for quite for a few minutes, looking for it, because it's not under Ivan, it's under Yoan. Uh, masculine, we, we want to, we, gender agreement is one thing we want. It says, it's the Russianization of John, uh, and there's a, there's, uh, Yoan is a Russianization of John, there's a variant for spelling of it, Ivan, and the example that uh, we could include is Ivan Fomensin 1181-2. Okay, and there's end of the link. That's good documentation. Now we know how that, how that element was used as a given name, um, where it came from, what it means, what date it was found, Remember, dates are important, too, because uh, period, just because it's period, that's not the end. Uh, all elements have to be within 500 years of each other if you're using one language, or within 300 years of each other if you're using uh, two, uh, two different language groups. Now, Russian is a special case, and we'll get back to that. But, uh, you know, so we will, if you don't list the dates, how do we know they're temporally compatible? All right, Baranov. Yada yada yada, under the name Baran, which means ram, and there's a patronymic form, Baranov, Maish Baranov, found it, okay, 1500, that's within 500 years of 1181, and then it talks about construction. Now, Russian is one of those things that's not listed in, in, in um, Appendix A because it's so complicated, and Appendix A basically just says, go see Wickenden, go see this, and there it says, you know, uh, in the grammar section, we'll list the pattern uh, G-P, which is given name plus patronymic. Ivan is a given name. Baranov is patronymic. Uh, as it's already in patronymic form, it doesn't have to be modified. There. Done. That's good documentation for that name. Okay, that's the goal. Will you always have every element like that? No. Sometimes you, can, you just can't get everything. Uh, but this is what, we, what you should be uh, striving for. Uh, in, in every submission. And it doesn't matter how common it is, you know, Ivan is as common as John, but we still want to document it. And this construction is about as, as standard a Russian construction as you can get, given name plus patronymic, we still want to document it. There's some other problems. All right, um, we talked about not listing the name information panel. Uh, my recommendation is always list it. Uh, most are found in Appendix A of Sina, even if it's something obvious like John Smith, just say, Sina Appendix A, list the pattern, given plus by name, is acceptable in early modern English. That's all you need. Okay, it doesn't have to be a novel. Just include that phrase. You know, feel free to cut and paste it from my uh, notes. But say something. Not referring to Appendix C to show that a mix of two language groups is acceptable. That you should do that. You know, English and French are an acceptable lingual mix under Sina Appendix C. You know, a lot of us know mo many of the mixes of hand. Many people don't. Okay, I know of hand that English and French can be combined. How about English and Dutch? How about English and German? How about Dutch and German? I don't know. Just mention it. You know, because guess what? If it's not in Appendix C, then you shouldn't be mixing it unless you're providing a lot of more documentation. Okay, um, not including any documentation at all. We get an awful lot of these, many of these. 
many, many, many of these. Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not a stock source for documentation. Now, Wikipedia is often a really good start place to start documenting. Um, you know, we can look at the citations in Wikipedia for more information. And it's also okay for generally acceptable facts, uh, just not for name elements. So, you know, I, will, I want to say that I'm, you know, John of London. Well, did London exist in our period? We go to the Wikipedia entry and it says London was founded by the Romans in the 400s. Fine. Now, that doesn't mean it was called London. You know, it may have had a different spelling. But at least that, but that tells us how old it is. And that we will accept. Okay, if it's a generally acceptable fact. You know, we, you don't have to go and find an Encyclopedia Britannica to tell you, you know, when a city was founded. Or um, this is more in... Uh, Armory, the names, but the same idea. You know, we, I often go to Wikipedia to find the range of an animal. You know, was this animal known to Euro Europeans? Well, well, I don't know. What was the animal's range? You know, where was this animal found? Oh, it was found in Greece and the Balkans. Fine, that's part of Europe. You know, things like that. Yeah, that's fine for Wiki to go to Wikipedia, but not as a not to cite a name. Of it. Right, I mentioned already websites such as behind the name genealogy sites. Um, sites that try to sell you things. Uh, we had a submission this month that the only documentation was behind from the behind the name website. Okay, that means either Alice is going to have to do work on it, or the commenters are going to have to do work on it. Um, now, not all of these necessarily come from heralds. A lot in the East, at least, a lot of people send in their own stuff. We can't control what they do, but we can control what the heralds do. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, um, in not including uh, any documentation at all. Uh, now, sometimes you just don't have documentation. Sometimes a client comes to you and says, you know, I want this name. I think it's a period Mongolian name. And you say, I know nothing about Mongolian. I've looked at the couple of articles. I don't have any information on it. And the person says, absolutely not. Someone who knows all about Mongolian told me at Penzik that this was fine and that he could document it. Well, who told you that? I don't know, some guy. He had a yurt. Great, thanks. It's fine to submit that. What you do, but but be explicit and say, be, say just that. Submitter insists this is a period name. Uh, the you know at cons at time of consultations we lacked uh, resources to document it. We ask for help. Document what you can. Maybe you can only document one name element and not the other, or you know two out of three. Include what you can. And it's okay to ask for help. Another option, if you have time, you can't do this as easily at a consulting table, but another option is ask for help before submitting. Post to one of the lists. Post to the Facebook group. If it's a complicated name question, personally, I skip everything else and go straight to SCA Heralds, the big mailing list, because that's where all the senior heralds hang out. You know, if, I need, if I have someone with Mongolian, I'm going straight there. Uh, if, or, you know, or something really obscure. And then maybe they will get you with documentation, and then you can put it in. And you don't, and you won't submit uh, a bare. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Penzik, you know, um, last year I had somebody who wanted a specific Hungarian name. He said, "Well, I've researched the heck out of it, uh, and I know this was a river in Hungary, and this is the period spelling, but I don't have any documentation. But I want to submit." Okay. We put it down, and we said, submitter believes this is a period spelling for a river. We found on Wikipedia that this river exists, and that's its current name. Submitter believes it's a period spelling, but he's willing to adjust, because he was. Um, you know, please help, because the truth is we only have a couple of people in the society that know Hungarian, and there were no resources at Penn. And guess what? Turns out the submitter was right. The name was accepted in his spelling. He, did, he had done his homework. He just didn't bring the homework with him. Fine. That's a special situation. All right, some more examples. Th these are f from Alice. So here's documenting the name uh, Ian O. Adam. I don't know how to pronounce that. I saw. I looked at it and said, "Isn't that Indian?" No, apparently it's Irish. All right. So here's what we. Here's how Alice would document this. Uh, number one, quick and easy Gaelic names, third edition by Sharon Krosa from that website, sets out the pattern for clan affiliation uh, styles by names as single given names, or with an apostrophe eponymous clan ancestor's name in genitive case. Okay. Owen is an early modern Irish Gaelic name, 
with 58 annals uh, dates between 1246 and 1600 appearing in an index of names in Irish annals by Kathleen O'Brien. There's the link. Fine. The other one is also found there um, with the following dates. Uh, it's in the nominative form, and there's how you put it in the genitive form. Done. Now, here's a question I've got, because this is the actual document that I use a lot when I'm doing the polish work on uh, documenting for a client. Um, but I also noticed that what you were talking about, like the CNA uh, reference on how a name construction goes together, is not included. Is there times we could bypass that? Or? Yes. You have to document the construction. Right. If it comes from CNA, it's automatically documented. Okay. If it comes from one of the other sources that we generally accept, like Quick and Easy Gaelic Names by Sharon Krause is pretty much the best starting point for Gaelic names. You right. know, if so, if it's in there, you know that's just as good as Appendix A. Okay. Wiccanden for Russian is just as good as Appendix A. Now, if you don't have something like that, and you think that you found another pattern um, that you want to document, then you need to document the pattern. And that's very similar to the way we do IAPs, individually tested patterns, in uh, Armory. You need three examples of the pattern that are clearly on point to what you're doing. You know, and, and, and that's much more involved. Honestly, I, I'm not sure I've seen one in the last two years, anyone doing that. And that's mostly because Appendix A covers so many patterns that you, you rarely need to go beyond that. Uh, and actually, if you look at Appendix A, for a couple of languages, it says, this is too complicated for here, look here. I don't remember if it does for Gaelic, but for Russian it says, look in Wiccanden. For um, Mongolian it says, look in such and such an article, um, because it's just too involved. Yeah, because I know on uh, Gaelic and some English names, I completely based on that whole aspect, so I got a few of them lying out. But anytime I get a Viking name that seems to be popular up here, I have to keep copying that patronomic and how it's restructured. Right. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, here's an English example, Marjorie, Marjorie uh, Potticary. Marjorie is found in English given names of 16th and early 17th century by Ari uh, Katmael. There's the link under the name Marjorie, dated to 1583. Potticary appears in Bardsley, that's one of our standard books. Dictionary of English Novels Show Names, page 617 under Potticary, with this spelling dated to 1591. And this naming pattern for English names is found in Appendix A of Cena. That's the way Alice wrote it, which probably means it's fine. Personally, I would have been a little bit more explicit in that last sentence and would have said, you know, the, the pattern of given name plus surname is found in Appendix A of Sina. That makes sense if the goal is to not make people have to look up exactly. what you've already exactly. looked up. Exactly. Here's one using IGI. Meliana Trinidad de Valero. The pattern given plus by name plus day plus locative for Spanish names is found in Appendix A of Sina. All elements are found in the Family Search historical records. There's the site for Meliana, there's the site for Trinidad, there's the site for De Valero. And again, I would have included the actual URLs to each one of them. That's not required. I like to do it. So there's, uh, that, th there's what documentation should look like. And if you submit documentation like that, Alice will be very happy. Um, so, let's pause for a second. Uh, any, um, any questions so far on what to document, how to pre how to present it, what to put into uh, your your document, your submission forms? That's actually coming a lot clearer than it was, I would say, about a year ago. Okay, good. Good. Oops. Oh, oh look, join us. finally joined us. Hello. Well, let's see. Not a bad spot to join us at. It's exactly the halfway point. Not necessarily by time, but by content. Hello? Anne, are you with us? I don't know if she's got a mic or not. Uh, let's see. Is there anything in the chat? Um. 
Okay, she's uh, asking to remain in chat, which is fine. Uh, so we will proceed. So as I said, this is kind of a... Uh, oh, okay, the lack of sound is... Uh, um, she can't hear us, but that's going to be on her end. Um, all right, we'll give her a moment to try to fix, to resolve that. Well, now I can definitely say while we're uh, doing that, uh, why uh, she, uh, Elise, has been rather frustrated with me in the last few submissions. I'm sorry, say that again? Oh, I can definitely see why uh, the Elise has been very uh, frustrated, or appeared to be frustrated on some of the submissions I've sent out. Okay. Yeah, um, it, it would be good to, to include more dots. All right, well, let me, uh, let's, let's move on then. Um, uh, and hopefully Anne will fix her problem um, soon. Um, okay, so some specific sources. Um, so for English, uh, for late period English, family search. Okay, that's probably the family search is great for late period uh, most of Western Europe, uh, but English especially. Um, this is where books I think are the best. Uh, for given names, um, Withicombe, uh, Oxford Dictionary of English name, Christian Names, make sure it's the third edition. It's substantially better than the second. Um, for surnames, there's Rini and Wilson, and there's Bardsley. Um, Withicombe and Rini and Wilson, probably Rini and Wilson, uh, it would be my number one book to buy if you were building a personal names library, um, with Withicombe probably being number two. For place names, um, Watts, the Cambridge Dictionary of English Place Names, is probably the best one there is, but it's also very expensive. Uh, there's Mills, Oxford Dictionary of British Place Names, that's not as expensive, uh, that's available, and there's also one by Eckwall, but it's also not quite as good. A lot of these books, by the way, are out of print, but you can get them used very easily. Uh, if you go online, um, Talon Gwinnick has a good... Um, Article on feminine given names from uh, extracted from Rini and Wilson. There's many articles on surnames on St. Gabriel's. There's also what's called the Middle English Dictionary, which the link is there for. It's a little bit tricky to use. If you're familiar with the Oxford English Dictionary, it's similar to that. It's a historiographical dictionary that shows you when names, when words were first used. What it's great for is descriptive or occupational and place name uh, by names. You just search for the word and look for citations. So if, you want, if you're looking for a period Smith, you know, well, type in Smith. It'll tell you, you know, Smith is somebody who works with iron, and it'll have examples, and it'll include examples of that word used as a name. So very good resource. If you're going early period, Anglo-Saxon, one of the probably the best sources, the Proposography of Anglo-Saxon England, commonly nicknamed Pace. The URL is there. I don't know much about it personally. I haven't really used it, um, but that's the source that to use. Uh, if you can, if you have trouble with it, ask on one of the uh, lists. I'm sure somebody will uh, will be happy to to walk you through it. Uh, for Welsh. Uh, start online. Uh, Tangwistle's simple guide to constructing 13th century Welsh names, as well as simple guide to constructing 16th century Welsh names. I'm, you know, if you want 14th or 15th century, you're out of luck. But um, that's probably the two best sources. If you want to go to books, there's uh, Chris and there's uh, Morgan and Morgan uh, Welsh surnames, and there's that Bardsley book that I mentioned that's English and Welsh surnames. Gaelic. Uh, Gaelic, I always start, start with Efric, uh, it's quick and also known as Sherrod Cross, the same person. Quick and easy Gaelic names, and its companion piece, the spelling of lenited consonants in Gaelic. If you do feminine Gaelic names, you need to know how to lenite them, and that's like a whole university class on its own. Um, the other good online source is uh, Marie's... Index of Names in Irish Annals. It's hundreds and hundreds of names from all different periods of time in uh, in Ireland. The two articles, uh, the two first articles are how to put a Gaelic name together. Your Gaelic construction is, I find, very difficult. Uh, it's very different from English, even though it looks similar. 
Um, as anyone who knows, who's tried to pronounce uh, Gaelic names knows, it doesn't work unless you know what you're doing. I don't. So, unless you're an expert on Gaelic, start with the two construction articles, and then find the actual elements in uh, Marie's uh, index of names. Um, for books, O'Carane and Maguire, Irish names or Gaelic names, the two different editions of the same books. One, it was sometimes called Irish names, sometimes Gaelic names. Wonderful book, probably also on my top five books to own. If you, you know, if you're only going to buy five books, buy Willycombe, buy Rini Wilson, buy O'Carane, Maguire, and I'll give you the fourth one. I'm actually I'm not sure what the fifth one would be. Now, Patrick Wolfe has a book called Slime the Ghetto is Gull, Irish names and surnames. It's not a bad book. The important thing is, uh, and I've quoted there, the italicized forms are anglicized Irish forms that are late period or gray period. Uh, the Gaelic forms are actually early 20th century, but they're generally identical to the 1600 forms, so we allow them. But that's only for surnames. The given name section is not acceptable from this book. Uh, Wolf, the same author, also has Irish names for children. That's an Appendix F forbidden uh, book, do not use that, do not buy it, you know, try to not be in the same room with it. Um, so, Wolf, it's not a great source, it's not a bad source, certainly not a top book to buy. Ocarina and Maguire is good. Um, Scots, uh, if you guys, as you guys probably know, Scots was the other language in Scotland, there was Scot Scot Scots Gaelic and Scots. Um, the truth is most English sources are applicable to Scots, it's very similar. This, the one book of him that's really good for Scots is Black's The Surnames of Scotland. Uh, um, Greek, Byzantine Greek. There are two excellent articles online. One is earlier, 6th and 7th century. One is later. Um, I really don't know much else for Byzantine Greek other than those two. Okay, French. There's some wonderful online sources, um, a lot of them by Ari. Um, names from various censuses. Uh, these are all uh, okay. Excellent. And can now hear us. So for French, there's excellent online sources. Uh, they're listed there. Um, for books, there's a number of books. Unfortunately, these are very hard to get. They're generally expensive, and they're all in French. Uh, Morlay, which comes in three volumes. Um, Volumes two and three are about a hundred bucks each on the used market. Volume one, and no one has ever seen. And you know, I think there's like three of them floating around the sea. They're just incredibly difficult to find for some reason. Uh, Morley Picardy, that uh, third one there, is about fifty to sixty bucks and is available. Dozat and Roasting, the first one is actually fairly easily available, but it's also in the forty fifty dollar range used. You know, if I was only going to buy one from French, that would be it. But really, with French, just stick to the articles. The, the, all of those books are expensive and hard to use. Uh, German. Uh, online. For given names, you want to go online. Uh, those two articles there, Medieval German Given Names from Silesia and German Names from Rotwell, are excellent sources for given names. For by names, however, you want to go to books. Um, uh, Balo Gentry, uh, Dictionary of German Names, in print, easily available, not expensive. You can get a paperback, trade paperback from Amazon. Very good book to have. That's maybe my fifth book on my top five books list. Um, it's the Balo is a the German book. It was translated by Gentry. People say that the original German Balo is better, but I've never gotten seen it, so I don't know. The other really good one is Brackenmacher. Um, it's a much better book, but it's in German and hard, harder to get and more expensive. Um, all right, Old Norse, very popular in the SCA, as many of you guys know. The source here is Ger Bassi Haraldsson's The Old Norse Names. This is the book to have on Norse, and it is also probably number one on my list of books to buy because it is $6. Uh, and for six dollars, it will solve almost all of your Norse naming problems. It's sold by the SCA stock clerk. If you go to that link I listed and go to the very last page, you can buy it. There's no better, you know, bang for your heraldic buck than this book. And nothing else, nothing else I've listed will cost you six dollars. Um, then online, you can go to Gunvor's Old Norse Names, uh, Ari's Viking Names Found in the Landnamabok. 
and Ari's Viking by names found in the Land of Mabok. Those last two have a lot of overlap with Gerbasi. Um, there's some names in one that are not in the other, and vice versa. But what uh, Gerbasi gives you is an excellent section on grammar. Uh, it tells you how to form patronymics, how to put names into genitive case. It is really, um, you know, the best source for for Norse. Russian, Russian. There's really just one you need to deal with, and that's Paul Wigand of Tanet, known as Paul Goldschmidt, uh, Dictionary of Period Russian Names. The second edition is online. It's free. It's on the heraldry.sc.org site. The third edition is print, and it's available from the SCA stock clerk. Not for six dollars. It's like twelve dollars or twenty dollars. Um, it has a lot. It's it's the best name source we have for Russian. It has grammars, patterns, huge database of names. The third edition is substantially bigger than second edition. It's worth having, but the second edition is pretty good and free. So. Um, I do have a third edition, and I almost never use it because, well, that's not true. I'll search for something in second edition. If I don't find it, then I pull out the book. Uh, both are perfectly acceptable. All right, Spanish. Um, Juliana de Luna's Spanish names for the late 15th century. Elspeth Ann Roth's 16th century Spanish name. I didn't include it on here, but family search. Very good for Spanish. Um, Italian. So the thing about Italian is the language spoken in Florence uh, is the Tuscan dialect. That's what evolved into the modern Italian language. So uh, most people, when they think of Italian names, they're thinking of Florin names from Florence. And there's three articles there that are very good um, on Florence. Venice had its own dialect. Um, so there's um, three articles on Venetian names. We have, there's more articles on St. Gabriel's. Uh, what we have very little info is Southern Italy names. If you have someone that wants a Southern Italian name, you're going to have to work for it. All right. That's the end of our, the main part of it. I'm going to leave you with the same thoughts I always do. Um, registrable versus authentic. A submission has to be registrable. It does not need to be authentic. While we can encourage clients to design authentic names, we can't. We don't force them into it. Okay? If you have something that is registrable but is not authentic, you still need to process it and help them submit. You can encourage your clients to do period things. You can nudge them, but you can't make them. You, you can't. Uh, it, it's ultimately their name. They have to be happy with it. Okay. Um, this is something that's come up uh, in a recent uh, discussion on the Facebook group. Um, and I'm sticking by my point of view. I think it's always perfectly okay to point out to your clients, hey, I know you're set on this name, but here's some ways to make it more authentic. But at the same time, you have to respect their decision. Okay, uh, you know, I've been using this name for 20 years. That's fine. You can register it. But have you considered something more authentic? Some of them will say, no, I've been using this for 20 years. And some will say, really? That's better? Okay, let's change it. You never know until you try as long as you're, it's done, you know, respectfully respecting the client's decision. Um, heraldry is a customer service job. We're here to help our clients. Um, we're here to help make registrations happen, not prevent them from happening. So when you're consulting, make sure that they are happy with their submission. I've seen lots of situations where people said, well, what I wanted I couldn't be registered, so my herald convinced me to submit this thing and it's registered. But now I'm using the old thing anyway because I don't like the thing that got reached. Well, now you've just really, you know, you've wasted the client's eight bucks and your time and the college's time. There's, there's no reason to do that. You know, sometimes uh, people are set on something that's not registrable and you just, they can just not register. That's fine. But sometimes, uh, or you work with them, but uh, make sure they're happy at the end of the day. When you're commenting, look for reasons to allow registration, not prohibit it. Um, you know, if something sometimes you have to do both, but so, but it's how you phrase it. It's how far you go beyond it. If um, if something is a conflict, it's perfectly okay to say, "Hey, this is this conflicts with something else." But it's even better to say this conflicts. But if we make this one change, it will be fine. You know, that's a much more useful comment. Okay, we have Harold, We really want a reputation for being helpful. There's already a bad reputation for heralds in the society. I'd really like to 
work on uh, getting rid of that uh, reputation. So with that, uh, that concludes uh, the main part. I got a ping saying um, Ocarine and Maguire, one of the books I mentioned earlier. Where is it? Um, Here we go. Ocarina and Maguire, the first one I listed. I think it's a great book, but there's a big but uh, to it. Um, um, not all the forms in it are dated. We can only use the ones that are. Um, you know, so anything with a date is generally fine. Only some small set of them actually have names. So that's all. Um, stick. Um, that's the that's the commentary from the uh, folks following us. Let's see. Um, let me ping Alice and see if she wants to come in. Uh, the other, uh, I'm being point, people are pointing things out to me. The other thing to be aware of with Ocarina and Maguire is that some of the stuff is that's listed as Gaelic is actually Anglicized Irish. That um, um, and that brings me out, brings me back actually to something um, I, as a general bit of advice. Uh, one way to phrase it is: Friends don't let friends register Gaelic names. Oh, come uh, which on! Is, which is entertaining, considering all three of you have Gaelic names. <laughs> uh, uh, I actually, th there's, there's, a, that's the short version. The long version is this: um, ga names in Gaelic are problematic. Uh, they're problematic because they're hard to construct, they're hard to pronounce, and people screw them up all the time. And if someone really wants a Gaelic name, that's perfectly fine. You know, they're, they're, they're lovely period names. However. What I frequently recommend to my clients who want Gaelic names is consider anglicized Irish. Better yet, consider doing alternate names. Register your name in uh, Gaelic. Register your name uh, in anglicized Irish. And use both. Anglicized Irish is much easier to pronounce. It's much easier to uh, use to, for a court herald to call you out by. And it's actually a fairly period practice because most Gaelic speakers probably use Gaelic names amongst themselves, but the official documents that were mostly maintained by the English were probably in Anglicized Irish. So it's a, it's a uh, practice that a lot of people have found to be very uh, convenient. You know, you can do both, uh, uh, you, can, you, can do, you can kind of do the best of both worlds. That way. Same thing with Scots, Gaelish, and Scots. And, um, the other Marian is pointing out that uh, University of Dublin has voicing of Irish words, names, and phrases. That's kind of cool. I will have to check that out. Thank you. Actually, that's been pointed out that it only pronounces it in modern Gaelic, so you're still you're getting an idea of what it's going to be, but you're not getting a period pronunciation, which could be different. Sure. Yeah, but it's better than nothing. It is. It's a start. <laughs> and, you know, we certainly don't pronounce. Uh, Middle English English names correctly either. They're so, very true. You know. um, so yeah, so that that's just a thought. My personal opinion on Gaelic. If you if you have someone uh, looking for Gaelic, you know, especially if it's a newer SCA member who doesn't really hasn't been around much, you know, suggest to them as a possibility um, um, of of using. Anglicized Irish, either as an alternative or in addition to, or uh, or whatever. I, I find that to be uh, to be helpful. Any other questions? No, I'm good. No, nope. I know, I know. I got some paperwork to go through. Uh, and make sure it's all correct. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Alice, uh, I asked her if she wants to stop by. She says that she can't because the cat stole her headphones, or at least she's blaming the cat for not being able to find her headphones. I can believe this. I can totally uh, believe it. 
And she also points out that uh, rather than using that Cochrane and Maguire book that I mentioned, the better is the Marie's Index of English Annal of Irish Annals article. That's also listed in the presentation. So uh, there's that. Um, that's about it. Uh, let's see. Um, Marianne also says there's several dialect cho well, choices and many of their language customs have not changed dramatically. Uh, yes, these uh, also these yes these links will be available and this video is already up on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, I will have the uh, the PowerPoint uh, and a PDF version of it uh, up on YehudaHeraldry.com in uh, just a minute and that which. Reminds me that I forgot the last page, uh, because of course the last page is who you are, who I am, and where to find me. Um, so that's the only URL you need to write down: yehudaheraldry.com/ekhu, and uh, that link is King of Harvard University. That link will uh, take you to. Um, uh, to where you can find a link to this video, all the other videos, and all the handouts, and the stuff from this video will be up by the end of the evening. So um, don't look for it five minutes from now, but an hour from now it should be there. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much for no? the class. Okay. I'm going to stop the broadcast then.